there were a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages. These are mortgages that, you know, no documentation, don't have to prove your income, very non-credit worthy. But there was a there was a bubble mentality, a frenzy, and everyone, hey, buy a house and borrow money, fix it up, sell it for twice as much, walk away rich, you know, and everybody was doing it. Mortgage default rates rarely get above five percent. Five percent is really high in the mortgage market. So people were saying, you know, smart people like Ben Stein, the financial analyst, but, but the central bank and others were like, well, okay, let's get crazy. Let's assume a 20% default rate, which is which ne has never happened, but just assume that's true. On a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages, a 20% default rate would be a $200 billion loss, which was only slightly higher than the SNL crisis of the 1980s. You know, adjusted for inflation, it would have been a comparable loss. And the attitude was, well, we survived the 80s, we'll survive this. Yeah, it's bad, banks will take losses, stock prices go down a little bit, but we'll survive. What they missed is yes, there was $1 trillion of uh, subprime mortgages, but there were $6 trillion of derivatives. Yeah. That was invisible. So all of a sudden, 20% of that was $1.2 So you, you create derivatives out of thin air, yeah. uh, and there's no limit on how many you can have. They're off balance sheet, meaning give me the balance sheet of the company, I won't see them. You have to read the footnotes and then the, the information behind the footnotes. So non-transparent, unregulated, no limit on size. So the, the crisis was actually much worse than anyone realized. And then when it started to collapse, the, the, the contagion spread throughout the financial system. My point about 2008, it was because we did not learn the lessons of 1998 and we flew right into 2008. But once again, we have not learned the lessons of 2008 and we're gonna fly right into the next storm. In 1998, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, the point is each crisis is bigger than the one before. The uh, intervention gets elevated, larger dollar amounts. And are we now at the point where there's no one left to bail us out? And uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, okay, Jim, I kind of follow your analysis on how risk works and how com complexity theory and capital markets, how that works. But where's the crisis coming from? What's going to be the catalyst? It's actually a long list. Now, student loans, there are $1.6 trillion worth of student loans. So this will go, and kind of this gets to your point, Francis, you know, how does the how do capital markets and, and money markets and Fed policy kind of leach into to debt and deficits? Uh, so when um, you know a lender, credit union, or anybody a university makes a loan to a student and the treasury uh, guarantees that loan, which they do, it's off budget. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not strictly a derivative, but it is non-transparent. So then the student defaults um, and the credit union, the lender simply turns to the treasury and said, here's, here's your loan file, pay me. And the treasury pays the lender because they've guaranteed the loan. Uh, now it's on the treasury. But until that point, that loss is not on the books of the United States government. That loss is not part of the deficit. But when the Treasury writes the check to make good on the guarantee, it does go into the deficit. So we think deficits are high now, but there's this you know, trillion dollar tsunami of student loan losses that's going to pile on top of the structural deficits and make it even worse. So all these things are, you know, I'm, I spend all my time analyzing these things. I see them all, I can describe them. I can see how they're going to converge into, into a worse crisis, but in the short run, people either ignore them or they just don't know anything about them. Why, but why would Bernie Sanders even suggest that? And by the way, he's not alone. I think the other candidates of, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, one way or another, have suggested that they would do something similar, that we need student loan relief, and that ends up going onto the budget and, and onto the taxpayers. Uh, but there's a school of economics, and I talk about this in, uh, um, in chapter five of my book. Um, it's called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, MMT for short. Everyday viewers, everyday people to know anything about it, but more to the point, economists don't know anything about it. This is a new school of economics, if you want to think of it that way. So there is this modern monetary theory, but the leading scholar of modern monetary theory is a lady named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at the State University of New York, but she's the financial advisor to Bernie Sanders. What modern monetary theory says is that actually there's no limit on the amount you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and the market will either buy the debt, or if they balk, the Fed will monetize the debt. So how much debt 
is their relative to the size of the economy. The, this is called the debt to GDP ratio. But mm. the way it's a simple fraction you learn in the fifth grade, how much debt divided by the size of the economy. So in a simple example, if you had uh, five trillion dollars of debt and a ten trillion dollar economy, that fraction would be one half. So you would mm. say the debt to GDP ratio is one half or 50 percent. Today, the debt is larger than the economy. Yeah. That ratio is over 100%. We had round numbers, about $23 trillion of debt and about a $22 trillion economy. So the, the ratio is about 105%, highest since World War II. That troubles me, it troubles other economists. But my friend Stephanie says, what's the problem? You could take it to 150%, 200%. 250%. By the way, that's where Japan is. Japan's at 250%. Greece is uh, 175% or so. Italy's uh, 135%. They're all still standing. If you go to the Ginza, you know, it looks like Times Square. So you don't see visible signs of stress. And, uh, and here's the irony. Ben Bernanke would absolutely not agree with this theory. And he, he said so publicly. But uh, Professor Kelton says to Bernanke, you proved our point. You were the one who took the Fed's balance sheet and quadrupled it from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion or so you proved that you can print trillions of dollars of money without causing inflation without causing high interest rates without causing a run on the bank so all we're saying is you know you did it to prop up jamie Dimon's bonus we wanted to do it to forgive student loans we may have we may have different policy objectives but the process is the same what's the problem now, of all the things I've debated, I've, for years I was de dragged into Bitcoin versus gold debates, which I thought were silly. I mean, I don't like Bitcoin, I do like gold, but it's like fish versus bicycles. I mean, the debate never made sense to me, even though I did a lot of them. Uh, of all the things I've had to rebut, this was actually the most difficult because it's superficially appealing. First of all, legally it is true that the Fed can take their balance sheet as high as they want. There's no legal limit on the Fed's ability to print money. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio, and they're still standing. Um, it is true that the, the Treasury can borrow as much as they want, subject to periodic increases in the debt ceiling, which have never been uh, denied. Um, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So all the elements of the thesis are actually correct. So how do you refute it? Um, and the, the answer is that legally it can be done. Uh, and if your goal is to print a lot of money and uh, you know, forgive student loans or give a guaranteed job or guaranteed basic income, uh, whatever it is, in theory, you could do that. But there is an invisible psychological boundary. And this is what the modern monetary theorists don't understand. And I don't think Ben Bernanke understands it. There comes a time when people wake up and they say, you know, I don't know what's going on here. I don't have a PhD, but get me out of the dollar. Uh, it doesn't, and so, you know, I'll, I'll buy gold, I'll, I'll buy silver, land, oil, natural resources, buy a new car, buy a house, get me out of the dollar into something tangible mm. because I no longer trust the monetary authorities. I no longer trust the Congress. Uh, I can't believe that you're going to spend this much money without ceiling, without limit, uh, without causing inflation. My inflationary expectations will go up. And the way to deal with that is to buy hard assets, starting with gold, but not exclusively gold. There, as I say, land, real estate, um, and natural resources, they're all, good, uh, they're all good substitutes. At that point, interest rates will skyrocket. All of a sudden, the bond market will have difficulty selling it. The, the, you know, the president of the Congress could take away some of the Fed's independence. All of these assumptions could come crashing down very quickly, very unexpectedly, and that's the problem with the theory. In 2020, they were back to where they started in 2013, except worse, because the balance sheet was even bigger. It's not going to take seven years this time. It might be more like seven months. And the reason is twofold. Number one, we're more leveraged and the stock market is more bubbly. And so the whole thing's more vulnerable. Number two, the market has seen this movie before. Like, hey, we watched this play out. We know it, we know it doesn't work. And the Fed blocks. Now, so if the Fed suddenly slams on the brakes, says we're not going to keep raising rates along the lines I projected earlier. Okay, that might give the stock market a boost. And you can't assume that won't happen. You got to watch for that. But I would expect that things would have to get pretty ugly in, in all events before the Fed got that message. On the other hand, if, if Powell gets confirmed and feels like it's his last term and here's his chance to be Paul Volcker and he's just going to keep raising rates, he said, my job is to 
get inflation under control. The rest of you people, you're responsible for fiscal policy and tax policy and spending and, um, you know, shutting down the Keystone Pipeline. Welfare. And all that. That's on you, not me. I, my job is to get rid of inflation. If he does that, and he could, he might, you're looking at a recession, kind of looks like the global financial crisis and hope it doesn't. And there is a difference between extreme recession and financial crisis. They're two different things, but they can happen at the same time as, as did happen in 2008. Would the Fed back off if it became apparent that they were going to cause a stock market crash, a disorderly collapse and a severe recession? The answer is almost certainly yes, but the problem is it might happen uh, right. a- anyway. And I was, they, they might have gone too far, and this almost happened in 2018, and that was my mm-hmm. point. It was that by, the, by the time they realized their mistake, it might already be too late. So that's one danger, which you, if, they, if they had perfect information, oh, gee, we went too far, gee, we couldn't pull this off, we need to back off. They might back off exactly as you described, but they don't have perfect information. They have flawed models. They tend not to look at history and they could behind the curve. They could crash the car before they knew it was out of control. It's like slamming on the brakes on ice. You can slam on the brakes, but you're going to go for a long time before the car stops. So that's one problem. The second problem is you, you have to separate, as I said, recession, even severe recessions from financial crises. In 1998, we had a financial crisis, but no recession. Uh, 1994, we had a financial crisis, no recession. In 2000 and 2020, we had a severe recession, no financial crisis. That was not a financial crisis. In 2000, 2001, we had a the, the Nasdaq collapsed 80 percent, but there was only a very mild recession, and that was not a financial crisis. So the Fed might say, and again, might because who knows, but they might say, well. Of course, we don't want a financial crisis. Now, to your point, Nick, nobody wants that, and they do get out of control. But we're not worried about that. You know, we learned our lesson in 2008. We had Dodd Frank, uh, and I had this discussion with uh, uh, James Gorman, the CEO of uh, Morgan Stanley. I briefed their board, and they they gave me a lot of pushback. They said, "Oh, you don't understand, Jim. We've we've uh, we've you know we have more capital and greater liquidity and less leverage and better credit." And I, I granted, I said, you, you're absolutely right. It's a nice job. You're a stronger bank now than you were then. But in a financial crisis, it doesn't matter. The, the, the problem is systemic. In other words, as an individual bank, you may be better off. But if the whole system's collapsing, you can't necessarily withstand that. So they, they don't want that. But what if they said to themselves, you know what? We don't want a financial crisis, but we don't think that's going to happen. But we'll but maybe we'll just have to bear a recession. Volcker knew what he was doing. Volcker knew that there was gonna be a recession. And the recession of 1981-82 that he caused was at the time the worst since the Great Depression. Now, we've surpassed that twice since then, uh, 2008 and uh, 2020, although it's hard it's hard to know what 2020 was. I mean, down 36% in two months and up 38% in the next two months. I mean, what what is that? But uh, but at least in technical terms, um, we've had two worse recessions, 20, 2008 and 2020 since then. But at the time, and I, I began to live through that, I was around, uh, that was the worst recession. But Volcker knew that would happen. He said, that's the price we have to pay to break the back of inflation. And he did. And by 1986, inflation was like 2% or 1.8%. Now, there was far less worry about financial crises at the time. Uh, because remember, this was before the repeal of Glass-Steagall. You know, commercial banks, no one really cared about investment banks. They could fail. So what? They cared about the commercial banks, and they had a pretty good handle on that. Um, so they weren't worried about financial crises. But today you would be, uh, be for the reasons we mentioned. So the so there are two possible major blunders here, but again, don't under, underestimate the Fed's ability to do both. One <laughs> one is that they could they could decide they don't want a recession, but not know until too, until it was too late. They just tighten into it, don't know it until it's too late, and then the damage is done. The other one is they could sign up for a recession, say, yeah, sorry, but that's the price of getting inflation under control, and trigger a financial crisis that nobody wants but could happen anyway. So, you know, it's kind of silly and crib this, uh, you know, take your pick. Severe recession, but we know it's coming. Recession that causes a financial crisis that we didn't want, or just let the inflation rip. 
what's the good outcome there? What, what's the good one? Yeah. But I think I think those are the three choices. I think you're right. So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever is the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down, but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. With some exceptions, but they, they kind of like, you know, an inch a year, a couple inches a year, but they, but they move mountains. I mean, they just, they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful, but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of, of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but you can apply this to any country, I focus on the, the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. And a simple example, if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least default on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you know, you just write a check. It's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not, unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The U S just hit a uh, $31 trillion in, uh, in national debt. That is national debt, almost all of it in the form of U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, not all of it. There are other obligations, but mostly U.S. Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP. Do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130 percent. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30 percent. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions. No big deal. 30% um, is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. Uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Master's Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or, or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. If you, uh, you say, what's the critical threshold where, you know, water turns to steam or, you know, water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same. It's, it's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The, end, the, best, the, the best research says the answer is 90%. And this comes out of, you know, Ken Rogoff at uh, Harvard, also Carmen Reinhardt, who's now the uh, chief economist at the World Bank. But they've looked at uh, hundreds of cases over hundreds of years. And I like that because it's not just, you know, kind of cherry picking data. Uh, developed economies, developing economies, uh, economies that issue debt in their own currencies, ones that issue debt in other currencies, principally U.S. dollars, et cetera. So, you know, a wide variety of case studies. And they show that not, when you when your debt to GDP, GDP ratio goes over 90%, your, your multiplier of an additional debt, uh, of additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context, at, at 30%, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar 30 of growth. You know, assuming you spend it wisely, that's a, that's a big condition, but uh, you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar 30 of growth. Okay, the debt was productive if you, if you put it to good use. 
Uh, but that that dollar thirty gets smaller and smaller. As you get closer to ninety percent, it goes to a dollar twenty, a dollar ten, a dollar five. Past ninety percent, you know, roughly, uh, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar, and you only get ninety five cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then ninety percent and eighty five percent, etc. So ninety percent is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at one hundred and thirty one percent, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, you know, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of uh, modern monetary theory. She's a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter that, uh, you know, she, they always point to Japan. Japan is at uh, 280%, um, way past any, any member of the peer group. Um, China's probably higher. China's a little more opaque because, well, because they are, but also they they don't have as much national debt. If you, if you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of, of provincial debt. And the banks, the banking system is is owned by the government or controlled by the government. So when you throw in when you throw in the bank debt, the state-owned enterprises, the provincial debt, and the and the government. So that's the real national debt. Kelton says, uh, Stephanie Kelton says, uh, it doesn't matter um, because you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentina and you borrow in dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have, you know, huge trade surpluses, which they don't. So they just default, you know, Argentina is a serial defaulter and everyone expects that. If you um, borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Uh, Well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. Uh, what about uh, inflation or hyperinflation? Um, what about uh, the foreign exchange rate? Uh, you know, the exchange rate can collapse. And the, these modern monetary theorists um, show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. I mean, if it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning $1 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do. Um, and they, they don't, they're just not very knowledgeable about any of those things. But you can think of exchange rates as a conveyor belt. Exchange rates are one way the problems go from one country to another, or good things can go from one country to another, uh, depending on whether your exchange rate is going up or down, the impact on terms of trade, et cetera. But they, they completely ignore all that. They also ignore the role of commercial banks. They, they just look at the Treasury and the Fed and look at money supply, but like kind of M0, but don't understand how commercial banks create M1 and they do their own thing. They're not uh, they're not on as short a leash as, as they seem to think. But, but it, you know, if you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she says, well, we don't really need a bond market, U.S. bond market. Uh, we only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. Uh, but why, you know, why have, um, you know, he said, you have government spending. So the Treasury borrows money by issuing bonds, and then the Fed monetizes the bonds by buying the bonds. And that gives the treasury the money to pay the bills, et cetera. She says, do away with all that. Just give the Fed, you know, wire instructions for Lockheed. And if you need five F-35 fighter jets, order them and just send the money right to Lockheed. Why do you need a bond market? I mean, she actually says that. So, okay, kind of, I mean, legally that might be possible, but to suggest that you can do that without consequences is nonsense. And then you say, what about inflation? Uh, well, she, their view is as long as there's excess capacity and unmet needs, et cetera, you know, you're not going to have inflation because there's a lot of slack in the economy. Well, that's a legitimate debate. But what they say when inflation happens, raise taxes. Um, and the, by the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes? And their answer is we collect taxes to redistribute income. Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. Uh, but but it's important to bear in mind that Stephanie was the principal economic advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. And Bernie Sanders today is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, controls the purse strings. 
so um, coming out of Congress and Biden's kind of a cipher. He's, you know, he's barely aware of his own existence. So uh, Sanders is in a powerful position and she's, she's the, the Bernie whisperer, so to speak, who's behind all this. So uh, if you ask the typical member of Congress, can you define modern monetary theory? They'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means, MMT, you know. But they're acting as they're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior of the Congress, and again, just go back to COVID 2020, because we talked about the debt to GDP ratio. So in um, around May or June um, 2020, Trump put through a um, a one sorry a two trillion dollar COVID relief package, and that was when you know the the, pay, the paycheck protection plan that was eight hundred billion, and everyone got the the twelve hundred dollar check, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end of December, at the very end of the Trump administration, they did another trillion dollars, uh, almost, uh, and that's when everyone got the six hundred dollar checks. And now you're up, up to eighteen hundred dollars. Uh, by the way, those checks, that is helicopter money. Um, that's, you know, what the Fed does is is kind of nonsense. But when it's fiscal policy, not monetary policy, and you're handing out checks, that is helicopter money. And credit to Larry Summers for saying you're going to get inflation out of this. Well, Biden comes into office in January 2021, and he's like not to be outdone. He did his own COVID relief package. That was another $2 trillion dollars. And that's when we all got the $1,400 checks. They just handed them out. And then later that year, uh, or they did the um, trillion dollar infrastructure package. And then just to top it off, we, what did we get recently was the, um, the uh, just under a trillion dollar Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Well, and the baseline budget deficit, before everything I just described, the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year. So take a trillion dollars for 2020, 2021, and, and 2022, add on you know two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for his second one, uh, two trillion for Biden's first package, one trillion for the Green New Scam, and I think a trillion for infrastructure. That's seven trillion dollars on top of the two trillion dollar baseline budget deficit. So that's nine trillion dollars piled on top of what was at the time um, about a, a $21 trillion national debt. So that's how we got to 30 trillion. That's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. These numbers are mind boggling and MMT says doesn't matter, but it does matter. And it, it shows up the way I described earlier, which is it, it slows growth. You don't get growth. So best case for the US is very slow, weak growth, which we saw from 2009 to 2019. Worst case is you throw a recession on top of that, which we're heading for, uh, and the U.S. will be in fiscal distress. The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8 9 10% or, or more. The U.S. had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a tr- $1 trillion per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre-pandemic. The Congress threw $3 trillion of emergency aid on top of that. I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled $3 trillion on top. Now, this is going to take the U.S. debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de- debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator yeah. and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. If you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get if you get them right, um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy, starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, et cetera. So um, human nature doesn't change, or at least it hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, 
Um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one, an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, so what? So the G- debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. Who cares? What's wrong with it? 180%. We got issues. We got problems. Print up the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What What is the problem? Uh, this, this comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed. It's wrong, but it's it's got its followers, and those followers are now in the White House because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. They take the view that if the Treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? That's ridiculous, but that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they they um, build aircraft. They have benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be. That That's the, the real source of money. They also take the treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now, that's not legally the case. The treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. Oh. The treasury is just part of the executive branch. Uh, and the Fed is an independent agency, uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. Uh, a lot of people know, some people know that, some people don't, but the, the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so of Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate, but, but the theorists ignore that and say, no, uh, the Treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have, you borrow to cover it, you issue bonds to cover the borrowing. And if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free healthcare, free childcare, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2, or sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And like, look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is, this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it, but, uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain why, explain that. Uh, up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay down debt, when you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You, you hoard cash or people were buying gold, they were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So, um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must, the government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar 50 of GDP. Uh, now there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward, but, So what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, But there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, a general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, But it was actually a special theory. I think a little Einstein, I mean, because of the general theory of relativity. But um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, et cetera. So now 
not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll, give it, I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point, Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what, but what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right, the more you borrow, it's actually a headwind to growth. Now you get le- just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more, Oh, sorry, at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. I was a facilitator and then a participant in the first ever financial war game ever conducted by the Pentagon. We did this at a place, a top secret uh, location called the Warfare Analysis Laboratory. One of the things we did there, I was on the China team. I wanted to make it realistic. So I said, let's lie, cheat and steal because that's what Wall Street does. And that's that's a more realistic game. So I recruited a friend of mine who's fluent in Russian to be on the Russian team. And I had dinner with him before we went down to uh, to the laboratory. And I said, look, here's the plan. I'm, I'm going to persuade my China team colleagues to um, basically announce a, a new gold standard. And uh, we, we've accumulated enough gold and we're going to say for now and our currency is backed by gold. We're going to put the gold in Switzerland to keep everybody happy. We're going to issue notes from a, a bank created in London under, under English laws to keep everybody happy. Here's the thing. We're going to say from now on, if you want our exports, you have to pay for us in this new currency. We're not taking dollars anymore. And furthermore, and if you want some of this new currency, you can do you can deposit your gold in Switzerland and the bank will issue you some currency so you're in the system. Or you can trade with us and run a surplus and then we'll pay you in the currency and you can use that to buy our stuff or we'll give you loans. But one way or another, we're done with the dollar. And obviously this is very forward leaning, but the whole idea of a war game is to help the Pentagon think five or 10 years ahead. So the first thing that happened when these, you go to your embassy or conclave, you, you come out and you stand up at the podium, you announce your plans, and then everybody reacts and it's discussed, et cetera. The first thing that happened is there was a group. So we had the, you had the red team, the yellow team, the blue team, as the case may be, and they're all different countries or areas. But there's a white team, which are the referees. They decide what you did. And the first thing they did when we announced the goal move, they ruled it as an illegal move. They said, no. No, that's not in any of our scenarios. You can't do that. And I stood up, about 100 people in the room, there are three-star generals, CIA, FBI. You know, I said, wait a minute. I said, this is a war. There are no illegal moves in a war. The whole idea is to be out of the box. We live in a world where there are no boxes. That's what we're doing here. So they agreed. They said, okay, we, we think it's a really dumb idea, but we'll let you do it. Well, over the course of two days, it accelerated and gathered momentum. At the end of it, Russia got PowerPoints. Okay, so this is 2009. Within 10 years, so, so what were the, what facts happened? Within 10 years, Russia tripled its gold reserves. Uh, last week, 
the dollar value of Russia's gold exceeded the dollar value of its treasury securities. They have 20% of their reserves in gold and their, the value of their gold is more than the value of the US treasury securities. They're dumping treasuries buying gold. Exactly what we warned the Pentagon about 10 years ago. Um, and here it is in China has more than tripled its reserves. So we're not there yet, but we're moving to some kind of gold back world. But the point is that was all in the war game. That's all in the book. And I made one other point. I said. Currency wars don't happen all the time. They might only happen twice in a century. But when they happen, they can last for 10 or 15 years. That's how long it takes to sort out. What you describe about the Chinese money supply is absolutely correct. People in the United States complain, oh, the Federal Reserve has printed $4 trillion in the past year. And they have. They have printed $4 trillion in the last year. They're taking the Fed balance sheet from about... 3.5 trillion to 7.5 trillion. So yeah, we printed $4 trillion in the past year. Didn't do any good, won't do any good, but we did it. Uh, but Chinese money supply is even larger and growing faster. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds on China's internal monetary policy. I could, except to say that they're grossly over leveraged. The economy is investment driven, not consumption driven. They're about 40%, 45% investment. The US is about 25% investment. So that gives you some idea of how much, how investment is to the Chinese, which is actually okay if you're investing in productive assets that pay the way. They're not. They're wasting the money. I've, I've been to China many times, been going back and forth there for 35 years. Um, I've been out in the countryside. I don't just stick to the hotel lobby in Beijing. I got mud on my boots visiting these ghost cities. And um, so each ghost city, there are a bunch of them, actually seven up. Seven, imagine building seven cities. That's what I saw. And so they got one or two skyscrapers and they got mixed use and they got retail shopping, a country club, a hotel, a golf course, a pond, highway stops, airport, etc. And it's all empty. I mean, this is all empty. Shiny new construction, some of it still under construction, um, all empty. So I said to the communists, I said, what are you guys doing here? I mean, no, nobody's here. So, oh, don't worry, don't worry. People will be coming from the countryside. They will be populating these cities. And uh, I said, when? I said, no one's coming. And uh, besides that, you've already drained the countryside. That already happened. But I said, you cannot mothball a building. It's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time, today it's the Congo, I was in Kinshasa, but it was right after the 70s commodities boom. And they took the money, of course they wasted it and they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. But there's a skyscraper, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might've looked nice the day they built it, but it was never really used. And now it was literally, when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's gonna happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime, maybe never. And I'll tell you why, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% slice down at the bottom. And China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. They're treasury bills, notes, and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in. Uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers, you need auctions, you need payment and clearance systems, you need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issued trading, 
uh, you know, custodians, the rule of law. There's a whole massive infrastructure which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, you know, advising George Washington, and we've been doing it ever since. And others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure, and most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't ch- trust the Chinese as far as you can as throw them, um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency. None. Same with the Russian ruble. Same with a lot of other currencies. Same with Bitcoin. There's no show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it. You write op-eds. You pro- fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. And they're not going to be a global reserve currency. So we can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States. The first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed four trillion dollars. Congress, we had trillion dollar, what are called baseline budget deficits going into the pandemic. So with no pandemic, we were going to have a trillion dollar deficit in 2020 and 2021. Now, Congress put $3 trillion on top of that with rescue and bailout programs last uh, March, April, and May. That was the CARES program, payroll protection plan, um, aid to hospitals, uh, uh, extended unemployment benefits, higher unemployment benefits, et cetera. And I'm not saying any of those things were bad. It was needed uh, to keep things from getting a lot worse. But we put $3 trillion on top of this. So there's $4 trillion for fiscal 2020. They just did a trillion last week uh, in the kind of final days of the Trump administration. So that's five trillion. And Biden has announced his plan. He's going to have a two trillion dollar rescue bailout so-called stimulus plan now. So that's seven trillion dollars plus the trillion dollar baseline for fiscal 2021. So there's eight trillion dollars in deficit spending in two fiscal years, four trillion dollars of money printing by the Fed. Now, those are the numbers. That's not. That's not projections. That that's baked in the pie. Just don't call it stimulus. It will have no stimulative effect. Does it again? As I say, keep the lights on. Yes. Did would it, would just some people keep their jobs last spring because their employer got payroll protection plans? Yes. Did other people benefit from increased unemployment benefits? Yes. Was a lot of that necessary because things were in such bad shape? Yes. So I'm not arguing that side of it, but it does not stimulate. It's not going to get us out of the depression. Let me be very specific as to why, because I don't like to, I don't make claims without backing it up. On the money supply, you can print all the money you want, but Milton Friedman was wrong, the monetarists are wrong, the Austrian school is wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is something called velocity, which is the turnover of money. The money has to be lent and spent. Banks have to be lenders. People in businesses have to be borrowers. You have to be spending it, get it in circulation, in other words, in order potentially to have some inflation. Uh, And that's the technical name for that is velocity. Velocity is dropping, sinking like a stone. By the way, it's been dropping since 1998. It dropped faster in the 2008 crisis. It's dropping faster today. But the trend has been very steeply down for the last 22 years. Um, and so the you know, nominal GDP, so the, the, the dollar value of all goods and services, leaving aside inflation, that's, that's what we mean by nominal value. Nominal value of gross domestic product is money supply times velocity. How much money is there and how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other and that's your nominal GDP. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. Meaning you can print the seven trillion dollars, but if you don't have any velocity, you don't have an economy. And so you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and declining velocity. One offsets the other so that you barely keep nominal GDP where it is. In fact, it's going to go down about six or seven percent. We're not getting back to 2000, 
2019 levels of output, if you take 2019 as your baseline, we're not getting back to 2019 levels till 2023 at the earliest. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of job creation, the number of people who have jobs until 2025 at the earliest. That's why I call it a depression, not a recession. Now flip over to fiscal policies, like, hey, they're sending everybody $2,000 checks. And they are, the people are gonna get those checks. And so the, the Wall Street, which you know usually gets things wrong, that's the first thing you gotta know about Wall Street, because they don't really care about you, they care about rap fees and how they make money. So they're saying, all right, they're going to send out the $2,000 checks and people are going to get those checks and they're going to run right out and they're going to buy a car, a refrigerator, you know, paint the kitchen, whatever it may be. No, the first two things are true. They're going to spend the money and they're going to, or sorry, they're going to borrow the money and they're going to send people the checks. But when people get the checks, they're not spending it. What they're doing is saving it. They're, they're either paying down debt, which is equivalent to savings, or they're putting the money in the bank, which is savings. So certainly if you lost your job, you're not going to take your friends out to dinner. You're going to throw the money in the bank or pay the rent. Uh, but even if you didn't lose your job, you look around like maybe your spouse lost his job. Maybe um, your neighbor lost his job. Maybe you think you're next, like you have a job, but you're worried you're going to get fired next week. So you save it. And, and the, the name for that, economists call that precautionary savings or, you know, plain English, it's, it's saving for a rainy day, except it's raining everywhere. So, so they are going to, they are going to, send the checks out, but people aren't going to spend it. And that's the reason you're not going to get the stimulative effect, but you are going to increase the deficit, which gets back to this debt to GDP ratio. So take the total debt divided by GDP. And that's, that's some ratio. The research is very convincing, very clear. A number of studies show this, that up to about 90%, so 90% debt to GDP, you get a little bit of something called a, a, Keynesian, a Keynesian multiplier, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get a dollar 10 of GDP, or you get a dollar five of GDP. And it works maybe temporarily, but it works when people won't spend the money the government can. That's the idea. But when the debt to GDP GDP ratio goes above 90%. That's what physicists call a critical threshold or a phase transition. Now you're through the looking glass. Now the Keynesian multiplier drops below one, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you only get 90 cents of GDP. But meanwhile, the debt went up a dollar. So what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? This is going up dollar for dollar, but this is going up 90 cents on the dollar. So the ratio is getting worse. Guess what the US GDP, debt to GDP ratio is today? The answer is it's about 135%. So we're way past that 90% threshold. And by the way, who's in that club? I can tell you, Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. So there's your lunch table for four, you know, the four super debtors league. And it just gets worse. And that G, that ratio past 90% is a headwind to growth because people look at it and like, hey, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I just don't like what I see. And people understand correctly, and this is the behavioral adaptation that policymakers on Wall Street do not understand. But the, the, the behavioral ad, adaptation is people look at it and say, you know, I don't know how this is going to end, but it's going to end. I'm either going to, we're either going to have a default or we're going to have something like hyperinflation to make the debt go away, or they're going to raise my taxes. Not sure which, maybe all of the above, but I, I have to save more money to meet my lifetime goals in the face of some bad outcome that's going to come out of this. That's the real world behavior. And economists know very little about the real world. So, um, so the point is increasing the money supply doesn't work because velocity is declining. Increasing deficits doesn't work because people are saving, not spending, and they're preparing for worse outcomes. So neither one of these, you can call it money printing or spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate. We're not getting out of this. And that's why I call my book, The New Great Depression. The people ask me, are we going to have a recession? And my answer is we might be in a recession right now and not even know it. Uh, we could be facing a global recession, including China, but just focusing on the U.S. because uh, that's the Fed's sort of territory. So Powell saying yeah, the economy is great is, is nonsense. What he said, he said, you know, by the end of the year, we could be looking at 4.2% unemployment, 35 to 4% interest rates. And, you know, kind of 2.7% inflation. And you're like, wait a second, inflation is 8.6 today. How do you get to, you know, 2.7, number one? And then what about rising unemployment and, um, uh, and, and uh, higher interest rates? How do you reconcile those things? He said all three of those things. But what state of the world could make those things come true? There's only one, which is a recession. A recession would do it. A recession will raise unemployment. 
higher interest rates will cause the recession, and the recession will cause inflation to go down. So in effect, Powell is saying we're going to have a recession. Inflation, yeah, prices go up, so we understand that, or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called, not to get too technical, but it's called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. If there, and we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. The U.S. really started it, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Um, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. And you're exactly right. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors. So they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The other source of inflation is called um, demand pull. And this is when individuals, you, me, and all of our viewers and you know everyday Canadians and Americans, worry about inflation. We say, well, you know, I'm thinking about buying a refrigerator. Better buy it now before the price goes up or the car, house, or whatever it, it might be. They're different, but they affect each other. When, when, the, when the cost push inflation from the supply side has enough effect, there's a tipping point or critical threshold in, in psychology. We say, you know, maybe it is out of control. I better go buy some stuff. Then the velocity of money goes up and then you get inflation. So the Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. And you're right about that. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. Now, the question, of course, is can they do it? The answer is they can do it, but at what cost? So a general rule of thumb this is really simple. You have to get... Uh, forget about nominal interest rates. Nominal interest rates are the rates you see on your screen, you hear about the headlines and all that. Real interest rates are nominal interest rates minus inflation. Take the inflation out and see what's left. Well, right now, real interest rates are about 2%, actually one, one and three quarters under the Fed policy rate. Inflation's 8.6%. So, you know, just round numbers, one and a half minus uh, eight and a half, uh, that's, uh, that makes the inflation rate negative seven. It's nowhere near. It's got to be positive two. Real rates have to be plus two to, to squash inflation. Right now, they're negative seven. So that implies that the Fed has to raise interest rates to 10.5% to get to positive two real interest rates. That's never going to happen. They're never going to get there. They will destroy the economy long before they get there. So the Fed has no hope of squashing inflation from the demand side, as you described, by raising rates, unless inflation comes down for other reasons. So what they're going to do, they're going to keep raising rates, you know, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, hope that inflation comes down from eight to maybe three, although I think that's a stretch. You could get into positive real rate territory, but they're really far away from it. So I think, by the way, I, I described what they're trying to do. I should make it clear they're going to fail. They, they, the, only way, the only way inflation comes down the way we're talking about is if they trash the economy, a severe recession. If that happens, yeah, you say, well, do you, people still need to put gas in their cars. Well, you're right, but not if they're unemployed because they're not going to work. There's a lot here that's just for show. It sounds good on TV, but um, the, there's a lot less here than we see. But the point is, this is not over anytime soon. And even if it were, when you break supply chains, you can't just put them back together. It's like breaking a vase in a thousand pieces and you've got to go buy a new boss. It's going to take years to undo this damage. So I spoke to the individual who was probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. It was 30 years from 1989 to 2019. Uh, it was headed one of the largest companies in the world. And this is what they did among other things. Uh, and he said, Jim, you have to understand it took us 30 years to build it. It took us three years to blow it up. It's not going to come back in a year. This is going to take 5, 10, 15 years to build a new one. So, so what, it's what I call supply chain 2.0. Well, buying a refrigerator is a good idea. Buying a freezer might be a better idea. We're looking for food shortages by the fall. Now, when I say food shortages in Africa and Middle East, this will mean mass starvation. You may see the greatest humanitarian crisis in history. 
because they literally can't get the food. Everyone's like, well, gee, you can't get Ukrainian weight, uh, wheat. What's the big deal? Buy it from somewhere else. There is no, there is nowhere else. Canada and the United States grow an enormous amount of wheat, but we use most of it internally. And uh, we feed, because it's not for humans, by the way, we feed our animals. So this is how you feed cows, pigs. This is how you get beef and pork. This is an example of the supply chain, how it filters all the way through. So you would expect higher prices to persist. You would expect food shortages. Uh, buying a freezer is not a bad idea. Um, and uh, the future supply chain is going to be, the, it goes by different names. Uh, Janet Yellen calls it friendshoring. Uh, Macron calls it uh, constellation. Uh, I call it the College of Nations. But basically, we'll have supply chains in trade, but it'll be sort of members only. So U.S., Canada, Australia, Europe, others, Japan, uh, will be invited to join, but not China, you know, Russia is going to be in the waiting room for a while. We, sh we should be better allies of Russia, but the, the, the Democrats in the United States have pretty much made that impossible, at least for the short run. Uh, and then there'll be other countries that are kind of neutral in, in that scheme, you know, Brazil, India, and others. But the point is you'll still have trade and you'll have supply chains, but it'll be kind of friendly countries, members only, uh, and exclude China. So that decoupling is going to go ahead. The Chinese seem to be not only fine with it, but they're actually leading the way. Uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is moving back to the United States. Um, you know, the 20 billion of uh, new semiconductor plants in Intel. And why is Taiwan Semiconductor spending over $5 billion to build new semiconductor fabrication plants in the United States? Well, obviously, because they're worried about China. We're reshuffling the deck, but it, none of this stuff is easy. I mean, uh, Semiconductor plants take five years to build a new refinery. Forget it. That's like seven to 10 years. We haven't had one in the United States since 1977. So it's going to take a while to do all this. Well, we can do it. So if I said we're definitely going to have inflation, you would know what to do. You'd buy gold, hard assets, land, silver, treasury notes, government bonds, et cetera. If I said we're definitely going to have deflation, you would also know what to do. You would uh, reduce leverage. You would uh, have more cash. Uh, and there are, other, there are other assets you could go into. The problem is we could have both. There's no question we have inflation right now. It's, it's, it's front and center. But if the Fed squashes it and causes a recession or worse, you could flip to deflation very quickly. So this is going to sound like a, 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 an obvious statement. What you want is diversification. Sounds obvious, but most people don't know what diversification is. I see people, I've got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. I'm highly diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You have one asset class called stocks. Real diversification, have a slice, a slice of stocks, gold, real estate, cash, um, agriculture is a good investment, energy, forget you know, the green new scam. That's a joke. Uh, oil and natural gas are going to be around for a long time. The U.S. is heading into a recession, and we may be in a recession. Everyone's like, wait a second. Yesterday, GDP was up 5%, and it was. That was the number for for the, uh, the, it was the first government estimate for the third quarter of uh, 2023. It was up 5%, but it was very heavy on consumption and very heavy on inventory. When uh, wholesalers and distributors build up inventory, that counts as GDP. Well, it's fine to build up inventory if people are buying the stuff, but if they don't buy the stuff and you're up to the rafters in inventory, you got to start writing it down. This is where you see, you know, you go to the gap and you get like 10 shirts and five pairs of jeans for 30 bucks. I mean, the inventory situation comes down to the consumer. Are people buying stuff? It looks like the consumer hit the brakes in August. Now, the second quarter is July, August, September. Sometime around mid to late August, after two pretty strong months, and they were strong, um, the, the, the consumers just hit the brakes. Now, they've done enough to make the third quarter strong, but going into the fourth quarter, they may just you know not show up for the game. A couple of reasons for that. Number one is during the pandemic, you go back to 2020, 2021, what was going on? Well, starting with Trump in, uh, I think, June 2020, he gave everybody a $1,400 check. If, if you got a heartbeat, you got a check. And then Trump did it again in December 20, uh, 2020, sorry, um, just before he left office, it was another $600 check. Biden comes in and says, well, I can top that. And Biden does in uh, February or uh, February 2021, right after he was sworn in, here comes another $1,600 check. And then when people got those checks, they saved a lot of it. So what happened in 2023? People drew down their savings. They, the savings rate got really low. Like They spent the savings they had. They didn't make new savings. And then they turned to the credit cards and ran up their credit card balances. Well, that feels good for a while. But then if you're paying the minimum, uh, 
and rolling over the balance and you're at your limit, your credit limits used up and the interest rates are 20%, some of, the, some of them are 28%, you're going to double that balance in three years. Uh, so if you're like, oh, I'll just pay the minimum this month and I'll figure it out. Your balance is going up because the interest is compounding faster than you're paying it down at 25, you know, 20, 25%. So um, people are tapped down on the credit cards. They've used up their savings. They um, they're getting into a deeper hole because the interest is compounding faster than they can pay off the credit cards. Uh, and they're just backing away. And it's showing up in things like gasoline consumption. It's way down. The demand for gasoline is what economists call inelastic, meaning you just have to buy it no matter what the price is. You got to take the kids to school or get to work or go shut, whatever it is. You're just going to buy the gasoline, even if you don't like the price. By the way, lately, prices have been coming down a little bit, which is another, that sounds good, but it's actually a bad sign because it's disinflationary, which kind of leans in the direction of a uh, recession. But um, for gasoline consumption to drop, forgetting about the price, that means people are not driving. They're not going on vacation. They're not doing road trips. They're not driving any more than they have to. There are a lot of other signs. We don't have time to get into all the all the technicals with the you know negative swap spreads and uh, inverted yield curves and all the rest. But uh, it does look like the consumer slammed on the brakes around late August, early September. The fourth quarter could be a disaster. The stock market's starting to wake up to that fact. So I would say it's a pretty simple uh, recommendation, Matt. Reduce your exposure to stocks overall. Increase your exposure to cash. It'll give you, uh, you won't lose money on cash, um, assuming that inflation is not bad. And it'll give you a lot of optionality. You know, you can go, if things get really, really, really bad, if you have cash, you can go shopping and find some bargains. But uh, if you're in stocks and they go bad, you're just going to lose that money and never see it again. Um and uh, but if you if you do have a, if you do have stocks or some stocks, I would look at uh, energy defense, um, not, not for good reasons, there's enough wars going on, but defense will do well and mining because, uh, um, you know, gold and silver prices and strategic minerals will do well. So defense, mining and um, uh, energy are the sectors I'd be in. I'd, I'd lighten up on tech, get out of everything else, go to cash. Uh, treasury notes look attractive here because interest rates are going to start to come down. They, I know they've been going up. I get it. But it looks like they've peaked and have turned around. So treasury notes, a good two-year note, a five-year note will perform very well. And they're very safe, obviously. Um, and uh, and just take it from there. But you've got to be you've got to be tuned into the geopolitics to understand the stock market. You can treat them as separate subjects, but if the world's falling apart, so I, that's not good for stocks. Right. So when we say bond markets, Matt, we have to be careful which bond market. I'm talking about the U.S. Treasury bond market. Um, you know, the short-term short treasuries, you know, four-month bills, six-month bills, up to one year. The funny thing now is that the highest yields in the U.S. Treasury market are in like a six-month bill. Like, wait a second. You know, shouldn't, shouldn't I get more if I buy a 30-year bond or shouldn't I get more if I buy a 10-year note? Um, it's a longer maturity. More stuff can happen. Inflation, bank freezes. All those things can happen. I want a higher interest rate for my longer term security. That's usually the way the yield curve looks. It's kind of goes, it's upward sloping. The longer the maturity, the higher the rate. That's not true today. The highest maturities are right around um, six month bills, one year bills, going out to two year notes. When you get to the 10 year note, um, you actually get a lower interest rate, lower what's called yield to maturity than you do on a two year note. The interesting thing about two years is you get a high rate, uh, but it's less volatile than a 10-year note. Uh, it's more liquid. Um, and 10-year notes are pretty liquid, but but two-year notes are very liquid. Um, so you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can have a shorter maturity, which means less risk in some ways, and a higher interest rate. So it's, like, like I say, the best of both worlds. But the highest interest rate is actually from six months to one year. So those are very, very safe security securities and they're paying like five and a quarter, you know, uh, not quite five and a half, but you know, well, between five and a quarter and five and a half percent for six months, for a six month treasury bill. Why wouldn't you just buy one of those? I mean, it's more than what you get in the bank. Now, the answer is, um, well, yeah, Jim, that sounds good. But if interest rates go up even more, you're going to lose money on, on your capital. The, the value of the note or bond will go down if interest rates go up. That's that's bond math 101. You know, rates go up, prices go down. The opposite is true. Rates go down, prices go up. So you can make it lose money, but that inverse relationship kind of throws a lot of people, but that's just how it works. So 
Yeah, buying a two-year note that yields about 5.1%, very liquid, very safe, uh, good return, more than your bank will pay you, more than most stocks will pay you. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? Well, the answer is, if you think the two-year note is going to go to 6%, you might not like it because you're going to you know, if you hold it for two years, you'll get your money back. But if you want to sell in the meantime, you're going to lose, you're going to have a capital loss on the note itself. So, so therefore, the next level of analysis is, well, what's going to happen to interest rates? Everybody wants to know that. Um, in my view, they've peaked. Um, they're going to come down. Uh, and if you like that action, you might prefer the 10-year note because uh, a longer maturity has a higher, you know, not to get too technical, it's called DBO1, dollar value, one basis point. What it means is that, so interest rates come down a certain amount, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points or whatever. And I said, bond prices go up, which they do, but how much do they go up? Well, the answer is the longer the maturity, the more they go up, they're more volatile. And so um, to your notes, a really attractive piece of paper, very safe, you get your money back, uh, liquid, you can get out of it, et cetera. You know, the only reason not to buy would be if you thought rates are going to go up. I don't. I think they're coming down from here on out. But uh, if you accept that view, then the 10-year note is going to have the biggest capital gains. Now, again, it's riskier. When I say risky, I'm talking about market risk. I'm not talking about credit risk. You are going to get your money back. But from a, but from a market risk point of view, if you had to sell it you know, a year from now or six months from now, for that matter, uh, if rates go up, you're going to lose a little money on the um, on the value of the note itself. But uh, but if rates come down, not only do you get the five percent interest rate, which is sweet, but you're going to have a capital gain on the note because that's what happens when rates come down. So the big question is, have rates peaked? And I would say they have. And I based that on what I said earlier about the economy. If we're going into a recession, we're going into a slowdown. We're looking at all kinds of geopolitical risk, stocks are coming down, then interest rates are going to come down too. 